Hello, everyone. My name is Fred Rice. I'm the chief architect at the IBM Spark Technology Center down the road a bit at 425 Market Street here in San Francisco. And I'm here today to talk to you about building custom machine learning algorithms with Apache System ML. Now, I'm going to start my talk by answering what is probably the first question in many of your minds and looking at this title, which is, what is System ML? After that, I'll segue into a demo. And then I'll talk about how you can repeat much of what I did in the demo yourself by downloading and installing System ML and trying it out. So let's get into that first part. What is Apache System ML? So I've put up on the screen here a timeline, and you can see we're in the middle of 2016 here. To tell the story of Apache System ML, we need to go back in time a bit. In fact, quite a bit far back in time, to around 2007, 2008, when at the IBM Almaden Research Center, where I used to work primary, prior to working with the Spark Technology Center, there were a number of different research groups all working on scalable machine learning problems on top of Hadoop. Well, we called it Hadoop back then, now we call it MapReduce. And we noticed that we had all these different instances of similar problems, but we didn't have a machine learning group. So around 2009, our lab formed a dedicated group for dealing with problems in scalable machine learning. And once we had that group in place, we started attracting IBM clients who had interesting big data problems that they needed some help with. And so we went through about a dozen different engagements with various IBM clients. And through the process of working on those engagements, we got to learn about how real world data scientists out in the Fortune 500 build custom machine learning solutions to their business problems. Uh, let me give you one quick example. Uh, one customer that re, uh, approached us was a large automobile manufacturer. They had a lot of proprietary data from various data sources. They wanted to use that data to predict when they would re-acquire a car because it was a couple standard deviations beyond the mean in terms of reliability. In the auto industry, it's very important to have a good relationship with your customer. So if their car is bad, you want to buy it back so you maintain that relationship. Now, when we started the engagement, this customer had a kind of standard machine learning pipeline going. They started with their data, did some feature extraction to get some features and labels. They were feeding that into a machine learning algorithm. And out of that algorithm, they would get predictions. And the problem was the predictions were not very useful because there were lots and lots of false positives. And you really don't want to buy back a lot of cars that you don't have to buy back. So we went in and we looked, and first we focused on the features. We saw that there were a lot more additional features that we could get out of this base data, so we expanded the feature set. But then with this new expanded feature set, we saw that the data was no longer well-conditioned, well so we had to add additional data items. And now with this much expanded data input, we turned back to the original algorithm and we saw it's not quite fitting the kind of data we have anymore. So we tried out about half a dozen other algorithms until we found one that really works well. And at the end of this long process of iterating over the solution, we ended up with a 25 times better precision in doing those predictions. Now, we had a lot of other engagements that had this same flavor of repeatedly going towards a solution to a business problem. Now, if we were to step back, though, and look at this from a high level, over and over again, we saw the same kind of iterative machine learning development process going on. It's basically a two-step process. You start by building a, a pipeline, an end-to-end -end pipeline that will cover your use case, going from data to the results for the business. And then you ask, are those results that come out of the pipeline, is that prediction good enough to base your business on it? If the answer is yes, then you're done. You can move on to the next problem. But more often than not, the initial answer is no. So that starts a process of iterating. You find what part of the pipeline is not working, is responsible for those in and not good enough results, and fix it, and then ask the question again, and go through this maybe tens or dozens of times. Eventually, you find a solution that works. Now, to manage this process, the other thing that we found across these engagements is that for problems where the data and the computation fit well onto one machine, like a laptop, there is actually a very effective set of tools and best practices that work really well. Basically, the way that people do this out in the industry is a data scientist will write a high-level program that implements their, their algorithm, their pipeline in a high-level language like R or Python that's very easy, very concise to write. We'll run that program directly over the data, which fits on the laptop, 
and get back an answer very quickly so that the data scientist can ask, is this answer good enough? And if necessary, repeat the process until the answer is good enough. This works really well because we have this high level language that makes it very easy to express algorithms, very easy to run them. But as soon as the problem doesn't fit on one machine, we have to fall back on a different set of tools and a different set of practices that it turns out are much less efficient. In this case, when you have a big data problem, you may start out with a data scientist writing a high level program, but that program needs to get translated into something that will run in parallel. And for that task, you bring in a systems programmer who can translate that program in R or Python down to something like Scala so it can run on an environment like Spark. Then you get some answers back. The uh, results come back to your data scientist and you ask that question again, is this result good enough for my business problem? If the answer is no, then you have to go all the way through this iteration process. Now the trouble with this approach is that it's, it gets the job done, but it's very expensive because of two factors. You're writing the program twice, and in between those two instances of the program that you're writing, you have human communication. So that process of going from the initial program to your results that used to take minutes or maybe hours is now taking days or weeks. Not only that, but again, because you're writing the program twice, you have two different implementations. And if you get results back that aren't good enough, you don't know whether it's because the original program was not good enough or whether the translation to a parallel version was not, um, in, did not produce the same results. So not only does each iteration take longer, you're going to have more iterations because you have more complexity and more errors. So we looked at this, our research group looked at this situation and we came up with a vision for conducting some long-term uh, high value research. And the vision looks like this. We're gonna make that big data use case look like the best practice for small data for problems that fit on a laptop by building a system which we'll call system ML. And what system ML will do is it will take a program in that high level language, a subset of a language like R or Python, and it will automatically translate it into an efficient parallel program that runs on an environment like Spark or Hadoop MapReduce so that we can have the data scientist back into the business of running the entire iterative development process and get results much quicker. We can get the advantages of running on one machine, but the, be able to do tackle big data problems. We can iterate quickly. We can always guarantee that the result we get back is the same result you'd get if you were able to fit that problem onto your laptop. So that's the vision. Now remember, when we had this vision, we were way back in 2010. So since then, in the intervening years at the Almaden Lab, we had a lot of very uh, innovative, very interesting research going on. And at the end of that process, we had built up a system which was still called System ML. And one year ago at Spark Summit in this very city, our, our director, uh, general manager rather, Beth Smith, announced that IBM was going to give away this technology to the open source community by open sourcing the System ML system. And since then, things have moved very quickly. We made the code available on GitHub. We started an Apache incubating project. We did our first Apache release earlier this year. We have a second binary release uh, that is in flight as we speak, should be out very soon. And today you can go and you can download Apache system ML and you can try it out for yourself. And I'll tell you at the end of the talk exactly how you can go about doing that. Uh, some people have in the last couple months actually done that process of downloading it and trying it out. Here are some examples. IBM Watson Health uh, got a copy of System ML a couple months ago and started using it to build new algorithms for predicting patient outcomes. And they found that the new generation of algorithms by leveraging the high level language and the parallelism they had in their underlying Hadoop cluster could uh, get a substantial improvement in accuracy. Not only that, but they were able to use System ML to do a migration from their old um, Hadoop-based infrastructure to a new Spark-based infrastructure. Um, System ML can target both Spark and Hadoop. So what the engineers at IBM Watson Health did was they wrote their script once, they were running it on their Hadoop cluster, and then just by pointing System ML at a different cluster with the exact same code, by running on the job against Spark, they were able to get their iterative algorithm running 300 times faster with no code changes really imp impressive uh, benefits that they're seeing there. Another example is a company called Cadent Technology, which is in the business 
of helping uh, large cable um, operators and operators of streaming video to do ad placement and to help market to customers. And there's a lot of de very deep, interesting machine learning going on there. Uh, their chief scientist, Michael Zargam, approached the System ML research group a couple, actually the System ML group at the IBM Spark Technology Center a couple months back. And since then, we've been having, helping them to deploy System ML inside their infrastructure to use it on a proof of concept engagement. Oh, hello. He's right there in the front of the room, by the way. And he just, well, you can talk about it yourself offline, but the quote that we got from Michael is that System ML allows Cadent to implement new advanced numerical programming methods in Apache Spark and empowers the group to leverage specialized algorithms in their own predictive analysis software. So they're having some very good results doing the custom development they were doing on big, beefy, single servers running R, but on Spark using System ML. But really, uh, instead of these stories, it's really best to see the system for yourself. So I've dedicated most of my time slot here to a demo. So some quick background before we get started. In this demo scenario, we're going to imagine that I work for a company that does ad placement on websites. And I, in particular, my company is targeting ads based on demographic information, which is stored in the individual users' cookies on their web browsers. Now, because people don't like giving away that kind of information, the information I have is complete. So what I want to do is I want to interpolate it. I want to uh, uh, complete that set of information so I have an estimate of the full demographics about each individual person so that can trigger my business rules and put up my ads. The data that I'm going to use for this demo is some publicly available data from the US Census Bureau. This is called the Public Use Microdata Sample from the 2010 Census. This, the data set is a 10% sample of the US population. It's been anonymized, but it gives the full set of survey responses on the short survey for all of those people. Now, because time is very short here, I'll be using the California data, which is 10% of the population of California, so it's still quite big. And we're going to use this data set, which is, of course, the full demographic information, to generate some synthetic data that would look like what we had if we had only partial information. And then we're going to fill in those holes again using some machine learning, some custom algorithms. So I'm going to switch now to my web browser window. Now, if you were to deploy system ML to, to run some machine learning algorithm to build an algorithm. The first thing you need to do is get a copy of SystemML. To do that, you go to systemml.apache.org. That's systemml.apache.org. And you click on the big blue button here. And that takes you to a download page where you get a tarball. And if you unpack that tarball and look inside, hopefully you can uh, read the text here, there's a jar file in there called systemml.jar. You can use that jar file as the argument for Spark submit if you're running from the command line. Or you can attach that jar file to your Zeppelin interpreter, and you can use our API, which we call ML context, that functions a lot like a SQL context. You write down a script in terms of our language, which looks like a subset of R, or alternate language, which is a subset of Python. And you can register some inputs that come in this Spark data frames. And you can execute a script that you pass in as a string, like if you were executing a SQL statement. And this is a very useful way to do integration, not only for notebooks like Zeppelin and Jupyter, but also to run applications. Uh, but today, I've actually got something a bit cooler, because this Zeppelin server that I've got running on the IBM Cloud is actually an experimental custom build of Zeppelin that uh, one of the committers on System ML has been experimenting with <coughs> that has native System ML integration. So if we switch over here, we will see what I mean. So remember I said my data, our data set is the public use microdata sample from the US Census Bureau. In here we've got some, the data wrangling part of my demo, which I have. I will make my text bigger? Yes, absolutely. And what I'm going to do is like that, and then like that, and that, and that. There we are. Better? OK, we'll be zoomed in for the rest of this presentation. So hopefully we can read things on the screen. So we're looking first at the data wrangling part of the demo. We're going to use Spark to get that input data and massage it into a format that's useful for machine learning. The data comes in in two files, one file with records about persons, one file with records about their households. We need to join those two things together with, which, with Spark data frames. That's a very simple thing to do. We just call the join operator. 
and we filter out some additional columns that are just metadata about the statistical properties of the other columns. And then we end up with this data frame containing records about each individual person's personal demographic information as well as the information about their household. Uh, since this is Zeppelin, we can do cool things like uh, showing histograms, of uh, this is the number of persons in household field, the number of persons over 60. We'll come back to these histograms in just a sec. The other thing that we can do, because we're running on a special build of Zeppelin here, this experimental build, is we can put this data frame into the special variable Z, which Zeppelin uses for exchanging across different programming languages, and we can switch over into SystemML's domain-specific language, our R-like language called DML, that stands for Domain, sorry, Declarative Machine Learning, and we can read back that data frame as a matrix. So when we run, execute this command, it'll go dig into Spark, do whatever computations are necessary to compute the tuples in that data frame, convert it into matrix, uh, turn, translate that, that into a binary blocks distributed across the cluster. It takes about five minutes, so I've run that ahead of time, but you can see the plan, and again, this needs to be zoomed in a bit, sorry, that was executed back when it was running. We have, at the left here of the screen, you can see we have some uh, Spark SQL jobs running to scan the two files, to join them together, and then right in the middle of the stage of the Spark job, the sec third stage of the Spark job, we are getting translating into Spark code that was generated by the SystemML optimizer to take this data frame and translate it in parallel into a matrix. So we, we go through the lines of the data frame, we generate blocks, we distribute those blocks across the cluster, and now we have a binary matrix distributed across our cluster ready to do uh, parallel computation on it. So coming back to our web browser, there we are. Uh, so since I ran this ahead of time, I just saved the data in binary format, because once you've done that translation, it's much quicker to uh, cache it on disk and load it back again. So I'm gonna go into, oops, a second browser window, where I'm gonna start up a fresh session using our internal language, DML, our subset of R, to do some actual machine learning on this data. So I start out, it started out by reading in the data. You can see that took just a few seconds as opposed to the five minutes it took to generate it in the first place because it's already nicely spread across the cluster. Now what I'd like to do is let's do some, let's finish up the data wrangling. So this data as it came in was coded such that the value zero actually indicates one of the values in each of the census data. Every field is the answer on one of the, the form questions. So we need to add one to everything because I want to use the value zero to indicate no, no demographic data is present. But because this is all as a matrix, that's really, really simple to do. I just take the, I define a new matrix D, which is our, take our D, our raw data, and I just add one to every cell and that's all. And just to prove that I have this matrix in memory and I've got all the data there, let's uh, do some basic descriptive summary statistics. Uh, so some column means, let's say, um, and then to, to string on that matrix after the computation. We run that and and we're done. So we've, we've taken that entire matrix and we've, done, we've added one to every cell and we've done this aggregate. And as you see, it returns almost instantly. So now we've got our, our raw data, which is real data, but we need to make some synthetic data so that we can run our demo scenario. So what we need to do is we, need, we have a full set of demographic information. We need to remove some of it so we can generate that back with machine learning. So when you're dealing with matrices and a high level language that talks in terms of linear algebra, these kinds of operations, manipulations can be really, really easy. And let me show you what I mean. If I wanna strip out some of this data at random, I'll just create an indicator matrix that says what cells am I going to retain? And I can generate that randomly. I'll just do uniformly at random to save time here. And number of rows is the same as our data. Number of columns is the same as the columns in our data. Uh, all the values that are non-zero are one. And the number of non-zeros is about 30% of the data. And then once I have that indicator matrix, using it to sample 
uh, from the original data set is just a matter of doing a multiplication, a cell-wise multiplication. So I'll make a training set by multiplying. And then, what did I do? I must have mistyped something. Open, Gotta love demos. Uh, thank you. I think it's actually NRO and N, and I have N calls instead of N call. There we go. It's good to have uh, ex programmers in the audience. Thank you very much. So we run that. It's got to generate a pretty big matrix at random, so it takes a few seconds. And then once that has completed, we've uh, now generated our training set. Now, if we're going to train, have a training set, we should also have a test set. So let's take all the values that we just stripped out and put them in another place. And that's really easy to do. We just generate another indicator matrix. We'll call it TI. And we, just, uh, by, we can apply a Boolean predicate to our first indicators to do that. So uh, I equals to 0. Everything that's 0 turns into 1. Everything that's 1 turns into 0. We do another multiplication, and now we have a test set. D times TI. I run that. OK, now we've got, as soon as this completes, a training set and a test set. So let's use this training set to, do some, to fill in that missing data. The technique that we're going to use to fill in that missing data is matrix completion. We have this data as a matrix. It's got zeros in it. We want to replace those zeros with values that are consistent with the non-zeros. And we'll use matrix factorization to do that. I'll explain the details of that in just a moment. But one thing to keep in mind is all these algorithms for completing matrices tend to bake in assumptions about the distribution of the data that you're generating. And in this particular case, if we look back at the, at the data wrangling notebook we were at a while back, you can see our data, our data distributions look like this. They're all discrete. They're all greater than 0. They have a, if, and if the mode is close to zero, as in here, then you have, mode's the most common value. If it's close to zero, the, the, uh, the distribution is very asymmetrical. If it's further to zero, it gets more symmetrical. This should look familiar to you. This data is roughly distributed as, oops, as Poisson. You can see that right here. So the columns are roughly Poisson. So we want to have an algorithm that will fill in that matrix with new values drawn from Poisson distributions. And as it happens, there is such an algorithm that's somewhat obscure but fairly well known. And if you go to the SystemML homepage, source code for that algorithm in our high-level language is right there. So we can copy and paste that. Actually, I've got a version here with a little bit of boilerplate before and after for input and output. I'll stick that into the notebook. And we can start that running. Did that run? Now it's running. OK, so I'll go back to. So while that's running, let me just explain what is going on here in the background. So we are factorized. We're, we're filling in blanks in the matrix through factorization. And the way that you work is we, this works is we have this matrix. Uh, every row represents a user. Every column represents a particular field in the demographic survey. A particular cell, if it's present, if it's non-zero, indicates the answer that user gave on the survey. If we take the data that we have in our training set, we end up with a nice sparse matrix with some non-zero values and some zero values. If we're going to approximately fill in the remaining values to complete this matrix using factorization, what that means is we will build two smaller matrices called factors so that if you multiply these two matrices together, you end up with a new matrix that has some new non-zero values in addition to something that closely approximates the original non-zeros. And these new non-zero values become the new interpolated demographic information. So that's the algorithm that's running in the background, a variant of this factorization algorithm's family called Poisson non-negative matrix factorization that generates non-zero values that are distributed roughly Poisson. And if we are lucky, it's going to complete in about a minute. This takes around two minutes to run. And uh, while it's completing to run, let me point out some uh, details of this that will be relevant in just a moment. On each iteration of this main loop, I'm computing the loss function again so that we can graph that later. I'm putting that into an, a variable called losses, which is going to be a vector of loss values. And at the, after running that script, I'm going to write that into that magic Zeppelin variable z, which contains the uh, 
which is used for passing data from one language to another. And we, we're done. We've finished our two minutes. So we now have our two factors, W and H, computed. We've got our losses inside this variable losses, which we've put into, that, into the Z map so we can use it in other languages. Let me just show you one other aspect of the Zeppelin integration, which is we can take these matrix data from SystemML and we can re-import it back into Spark as a data frame. So if I uh, open up a Spark paragraph in this notebook, I can say val losses, which is a data frame, equals z dot get losses, the key that we stored it under in, in the system ML in the previous paragraph. And then I can use uh, Zeppelin magic to show this, the contents of this very small data frame. And if we run that, then going full screen again, we get a call, we get some various visualizations. And the most interesting one here is we're showing the loss, the loss function that this algorithm is optimizing is just dropping and then converging as we go through different iterations. So the algorithm has converged, that's great. But of course, any time that you run a machine learning algorithm, the metric, the loss function that it's optimizing for isn't always perfectly aligned with your business needs. So now let's try and compute a different loss metric to see, get a second opinion on how well we're doing so far. I will just compute a mean squared error broken down by column. Again, because we're doing in our coding in terms of system ML's high level R-like language with matrices and linear algebra, this is very, very concise. So again, spark.dml to sell, tell Zeppelin we're using zip system ML. And we'll just uh, write down this expression, which I have to type here. Equals call means. We're going to take a mean across every column of this expression, our two factors multiplied together using matrix multiplication, then multiplied cellwise by that. Remember, we, were, we generated a matrix that tells what values were retained. So we're going to filter it down to the values that are in our test set. And we're going to subtract that out, to subtract all those values from our test set, which is another matrix. So it's just a matrix subtraction. And we'll square everything in that matrix. And then we've got mean squared error broken down by columns. And we can just print that. And run that. Takes a few seconds, because again, we have to multiply two matrices that produce a fairly large output. And we're done. And you can see, overall, we're doing pretty well in terms of squared errors. Uh, many of the columns have very low error. Some of them are not, we're not doing so well in terms of prediction, because what the algorithm's optimizing for is not the metric that we're looking at here. So if this was a real data science scenario and I was a real data scientist, what I would do is I would go back to this pipeline that I've built and I'd go and tweak the algorithm, tweak whatever step is responsible for those columns not working right, introduce some new uh, details to the algorithm to fix that particular problem. So hopefully this gives you a flavor of what it's like to do data science in system ML. Uh, this new Zeppelin integration you will be able to find hopefully in a couple months. If you want to get a preview of it, just go to the Apache Zeppelin Jira site and search for system ML. Let's get back to the main thread of the talk. And I just want to summarize some, oops, I think I just added a slide to my deck. That's not good. I'm going to press the right button this time. Wow, the right button is not working. Okay, summarize some key points from the demo. So first of all, we showed you that SystemML, Spark, and Zeppelin can work together. They can work together with our stable APIs very well, this is the ML context APIs, and they work together even better with this new prototype integration that I'm showing off here. I also showed that the linear algebra-based languages are really, really good for data science. They get you a very concise, easy to understand representation of a lot of critical operations. So it's really important to a lot of data scientists to be able to work in that domain, even if they're working on top of a parallel environment like Spark. The third thing I showed you is that customization, being able to copy and paste a textbook algorithm that meets the particular distribution requirements you need, being able to go back and fix your algorithm when you find it's not quite working right, is very, very important in these kinds of end-to-end -end machine learning use cases. So these are the slides I just added by accident. So I've shown you how I've shown you myself using system ML. Now I'd like to talk about how you can get all this software yourself because it's all available for free. And you can download it off the web. 
and run it yourself. And the way, place to go to start for any search to get SystemML for yourself is the SystemML website, which is systemml.apache.org. I'll say that again one more time at the end of the talk, but it's systemml.apache.org. If you go there, you'll see a picture that looks like this. There's a big blue button at the bottom that you can click to download our latest binary re release. Current release is 0 0.9. 0 0.10 will come out very soon. If you look at the upper right of the page, there's a place where you can look at a lot of our documentation. We have tutorials, we have reference manuals, we have install, ins installation instructions, all the material you need to get started. If you still have trouble with getting started after you've read all this documentation, you can either browse through the source code directly or you can get in contact with the members of the project or even contribute to the project. You can go to our mailing list, you can go to our JIRA server. This is an Apache project, so we follow all the Apache governance models. We're very open to contributions from outsiders. Uh, for example, there's a group at TU Dresden working on a Flink backend for this. Uh, there's other contributors at other companies. And we're very interested in having people use the software, having people contribute the software, so I encourage you to go again to systemml.apache.org and try this stuff out. So thank you very much for coming to my talk and for watching my demo. I encourage you to download SystemML. I'd like to thank the people who helped out in producing this demo, uh, Mike Dusenberg and, and Nicole Jindal. Mike is actually here, sitting in the third row. So again, thank you very much. All right, I think we have time for about one or two questions. Over there. Hi, uh, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, so uh, I wonder whether there's any um, head-to-head -head, head -head performance comparison uh, uh, between uh, a, an algorithm implemented in system ML versus, say, uh, ML, MLlib. The question is, have we had a comparison between an algorithm in system ML and an algorithm in MLlib? And the answer is, yes, we have such a comparison. In my talk at Spark Summit East, I talk, drilled down on the compiler, optimizer, and performance aspect of system ML. And we have some numbers there. Now, the, the thing to keep in mind is anytime you're comparing two uh, machine learning algorithms, it's not just about wall clock running time. You also have to take into account how well it converges. What is the error? You also have to take into account, does the data fit the particular algorithm that you're doing? So I talked about all these aspects in my talk, which you can find on the Spark Summit East website. It's a great question. Thank you very much. All right, that looks like it's it. Let's okay. have one more round of applause for our speaker. <laughs>